At this time, we're going to begin. This is class number seven this evening, and we're going to look in our notes on page 24. Page 24. This is chapter five in our book. If you want to please open up to your book. <laughs> you, you didn't preach long enough. You didn't preach long enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe just write down where the blanks are. You might want to write down the blanks that will be appearing up on the screen so you could fill it in when you get home. So chapter five is the process of explanation. And this is a great chapter, and I hope it'll be very helpful to you. I like, just as an introduction to this, you know, and, and how I often look at preaching, I look at preaching kind of the way, at least my goal, and I, I'm always looking to preach the, the best sermon I've ever preached. I, I haven't gotten there by far, you know, but I, I am trying to get better as a preacher all the time because preaching is, is like an art. Preaching is, preaching is like a sport, if you will, and I, I love sports. You know that, and I remember watching Michael Jordan play basketball. He could do the most incredible things, but how did he make it look? That's right. That's greatness. That's greatness when you could do something so difficult, whether it's tennis or basketball. or I mean, you see a guy catch a football like with one hand, straining every muscle and fiber in his body, and, and then he lands. And, and it always breaks my heart if he juggles it just a little bit or something. like You know, they say incomplete pass nowadays. But anyway, to do that, something so hard and make it look like that wasn't that hard for him. But that's what you want to do as a preacher or as a pastor or in your Bible teaching, because we are taking difficult things, difficult concepts, mysterious concepts. I mean, if you're going to teach on the Trinity, for example, that is very difficult and mysterious for our mind to understand. Or if you're going to teach on prophecy, or these kinds of things are difficult. And but to make the difficult simple and clear, that's our goal, you know, as a preacher. And that's, I believe, what a good preacher will, will attempt to do. So let's look at this uh, briefly here tonight, this chapter, the process of explaining. So remember, we can ask, what can I say about this text and try to create something but that's not our goal. Our goal is to go to the text and say, what does it say? And then seek to explain and put light on that and discover the truth and make it known. So we're not trying to create something. We're, we're seeking to discover the truth, make it known. So he talks about the labyrinth here, the first blank that you can put here in your notes. Expository preaching sheds ordinary light on the path that leads to understanding a biblical text. So we want to help people to understand the text and then make it practical to say, wow, that meant something for me in my life. So what are the questions that he asks in our book on page 88 and 89? What is, what's the first question there on page 88? And if you're on Zoom, you want to shout it out, you may. Or someone here. What's, what are the questions on page 88 and 89? What does the, what does text, the text mean? mean? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Liz, did you say that? What does the text mean? Yep. Yeah. What does the text mean? Okay. So that's the first blank there under the six critical questions. We want to, we have, so we have to explain, and that's what this chapter is, the process of explanation. Then the second question is what? How do I know what the text means? Okay, how do I know? How do I know what the text means? So that's where you, you study the words, you study the, con the context, the history, the grammar, and so forth, things that we've discussed. Then what's the third question? Someone else who's got the book, Raul? What concerns cause the text to be written? Okay, what concerns cause the text to be written?
And that's where looking at original intent of the author is helpful. And something that kind of shifted my whole gaze, if you will, even of the Pentateuch, when you're preaching and if you're doing a message in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you have to constantly think about, well, who wrote those books? Moses. And he wrote them for a nation that was coming out of slavery, right? And going to go into Canaan land. And that might not enter every one of your lessons or messages, but it has to be in the back of your mind of what concerns caused that text to be written to the Jewish people coming out of Egypt about to go into the land of promise. And it's amazing how many of those stories would you think about how did it relate to Israel in that context and then relate it to our lives coming out of a situation, facing a new challenge or whatever? You see what I'm saying? So what were the concerns? What's the fourth question on page 89? Who's got the book there? Do you have that, Esther? Okay. And so that reminds us of what? What have we learned about the fallen, the condition focus? What? So what do we share in common to whom that passage was written? Common is the blank there. What do we share in common? Okay. And let's go to somebody there. Um, you know what I need to actually do? That's what I need to do. Okay. Uh, Brother Andrew, do you have the next question? Question number five. Yes, yes, I do. How should people now respond to the truths of the text? Okay, so now we're getting more to the practical, right? How to apply the truth of the how should, so what do I do with it? Okay, I, I it, it relates to me, so now what do I do? Okay, so make it practical. How do people respond? And then the last Point there, Rogelio, what is the last question on page 89? Uh, what is the most effective way I can communicate the meaning of the text? Okay, so then, then you ask, now you're asking yourself, how can I communicate this? There's different ways, you know, and each of us is going to do it in our unique way because we each have unique gifts, experiences, and so forth. So even tonight, I was thinking about how the different messages your personalities came out in them. You know, one talked about his little sister because he's still a young man in his home. Another talked about police and law situations because he's in law enforcement. Another shared his, uh, you know, idols and even applied it and says, I'm preaching to myself because he's very, we know him to be a very patriotic person, you know? So the personalities came out. So you have to ask, how do I want to communicate it? And yeah, Inject yourself into it in that way. And that's good, you know, because we, we want to see your personality come out in the message. We want, it's not like you're just a board up here. You know, you, you uh, preach the word of God, but from your experience as well. Okay, so then now watch on page 90. And I have it in the notes, actually, so you don't need to read it out of the book. But I got this sermon definition right out of the book on page 90 in the italicized words there. Uh, Brother Joe, could you read that, please? The under point six, it's in the notes. Yeah. A sermon is an explanation of the continuing truth principles evident in the Bible that indicate how contemporary persons should respond to a mutual condition we share with those who are the original subjects or recipients of the text in the life of God response or provision for their situation. Okay, so that's kind of a lengthy way of saying it, but I think what he's trying to do is take all six of those questions and say, this is what a sermon is. It's an explanation of truth principle. So we're explaining truth. We're not making it up. We're explaining what God has said, right? And then bringing it to the people we're talking to. Because remember, I always remember this from a book about, and it was a book about um, teaching Sunday school. It was a book about teachers by Howard Hendricks, actually, one of he was a well known uh, Bible teacher. Howard Hendricks said this He said, When you teach the Bible, remember, you're not 
just teaching the Bible. You're teaching people the Bible. So if your audience is kindergartners, you have to teach kindergartners the Bible. If your audience is a group, uh, a class like this, I'm teaching you. You see, so you have to keep your audience in mind. We're not just teaching the Bible, we're teaching people the Bible. So we have to know how can I effectively communicate God's truth for that particular situation. Okay, any questions about that? Now, he then, next, then he gets into four necessary steps. The first step is observe. And I love his, I'm sorry, I didn't put that. That was, I didn't put the last two blanks up there. Okay, respond in an effective way. I'm sorry. Okay, so now I'm on page 91 in your book. The word there is observe. And he has a quote of our favorite of all preachers, Mr. Spurgeon. And Spurgeon said, and Sister Liz, could you read that quote? It's in our notes or it's in our book on page 91. But if you could read that quote in the notes under observe. So, Pastor, C.H. Spurgeon said, get saturated with the gospel. I always find that I can preach best when I can manage to lay a soak in my text. I, I like to get a text and find, find out it meaning and then after i have bathed in it i delight to lie down in it and let it soak into me interesting illustration i'm telling you <laughs> the, that's where the there's no book like the bible you soak yourself in it you when you're looking up definitions of words and you're looking up cross references and you're relating it and then like literally I'm shaving and all of a sudden this thought, yeah, what a great thought. I got to go write it down real quick before I forget it. You know, I get thoughts when I'm driving around, when I'm making my coffee, when I'm shaving, whatever I'm, because I've been really meditating on that. And that's where it, you feel like that's when God is really speaking to you in a very unique way about that text. So observe I was reading the Bible this afternoon, preparing a little bit for Sunday morning, and a phrase jumped out at me. And I preached this passage actually on Mother's Day. So I'm like, oh, I already preached this, but I'm restudying the passage. And a phrase jumped out at me that I didn't notice when I preached it last Mother's Day. And then I looked up that phrase, where else it appears in the Bible. And you know where else it appears? in the passage in Revelation where we're going to be in on the radio on Sunday night. That's, so this is one of the first places it appears in Genesis. And one of the last places will be in our, and I thought that, that's kind of cool. Anyway, so observe. I, I didn't observe it the first time is what I'm saying. Observe the details of the text. Really read the text. Look at the words. Observe who's talking. Observe what's being said clearly, you know. Pray over it, he says. Okay, what's the next word there? On page 92, where we're at here. Uh, Joey, do you have the book? Is Joey there? Bailey, are you out there? Can't see people, I'm just taking a... <laughs> yes, Pastor, interrogate. Thank you, Bailey. I, I knew you were going to come through interrogate so ask questions who what when where why how what does the text say how does the text fit together where does it all fit together okay so then he goes into that and he also has a good example of outlining just the passage of scripture outlining the text itself and he uses second timothy chapter four and that's not a bad exercise to do especially when you first start preparing messages, because that helps you see how the authors thought. Like, look, for example, go to page 95. You see this? It says, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. You see how he indents that on page 95. And in view of his appearing and 
his kingdom. And those conjunctions are saying that basically that phrase in view of his appearing and his kingdom, they're equal phrases. They're divided by that conjunction. And then preach the word. Be prepared. How? In season and out of, out of see, so those those two phrases are parallel. And then correct, rebuke, uh, encourage with how? Great patience and careful instruction. So that's a good exercise to see how that whole passage would fit together. Okay. Yes. Yeah, well, that's that's really a, you know, you have to kind of parse the, the grammar. But if you go back, well, look, if I go to this in the. I'm going to look at my King James because he's not using the King James there. OK, so I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's charging him before two equal persons. Right. God. And so, so that's what he's bringing out there. God and Christ, they're equal, separated by that. And then who? So that's modifying of what they're going to do, right? So he's, he, he indents that. Who? What are they going to do? They're going to judge. And then who are they going to judge? Two groups of people, the living and the dead. So he's, he just, so you have to kind of just think through it and see how it's written and that's very, you know, you have to do, you got to kind of know your grammar on that. And I, I could probably take like two hours to go through and explain, you know, even multiple passages. But it, it, but you just really, you know what I would say that I don't say that you have to do this, but it's a good exercise, especially when you're first starting to map out the passage of Scripture, especially, you know, what, what I would say is, is maybe write out the passage on paper, something like this, do the best you can with it, but find every verb and circle those verbs and then look them up and make sure you know what, what those verbs are doing. You know, if they're past, present, future, who's speaking, you know, is it active voice? You know, we talked about the voice, we talked about the moods, are they imperatives, that kinds of things. You really need to get into that, to the, to the verbs, especially. Now, but what he says in this next section, I thought was uh, very helpful in relate. Okay, so in the go look in your book to page a hundred, please. And here he explains the difference between an exegetical outline and a homiletical outline. Now we touched on this briefly in chapter six. And you might want to, sometimes I'll put like cross-referencing in my book, but if you want to put by page 100, say, go to page 115 also, because he talks also about the difference between, follow me now, an exegetical outline versus a homiletical outline. And what I was seeing in the outlines given to me, you know, when we talked about the points is some were giving in outlines that were ex exegetical where I've really asked for you to present a homiletical outline. So now what is, what am I saying here? Basically simply this exegetical outline means that you've outlined that passage in some way in your mind. You've exegeted it. Ex means that you've pulled out the, the, uh, the information of the text and now you're putting the information in an outline. So an exegetical outline is the information of the biblical text. That's the exegesis. But a homiletical outline means, this is what it means, so what? You gotta put some so what to it. How does it apply? That's the homiletical outline. So you build a homiletical outline by first doing the exegesis, you need to know what it means and what it says. And that's basically that outlining structure but that's not going to be your preaching outline. In other words, go back. Go back to page 95, for example. 
an, an exegetical outline of this passage would be um, Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead. That's the truth, right? That's the information. And then preach the word. That's the next verse. It says preach the word. Okay. So you could say that's an outline of the passage. And so that's the information of it. But so what? <laughs> Where's the application? What, how does it fit together in a way that's meaningful to the listener? Okay. So a homiletic outline, you want to take the, your exegesis and then make it practical. Okay. So let me just read this here. Okay, look what he says under sequence and order on page 100. You see that? The fourth, like the fourth line down. I'll read it. Under sequence and order, under organized. He says, first, an exegetical outline describes the immediate text. Again, again, more informational. Then skip down a little bit in the middle of the page, skip down about six lines. Second, he says, an exegetical outline also does not indicate the pastoral emphasis that the minister knows should be given to the various components of the passage in light of the issues. Okay, so an exegetical outline, it doesn't have that practical emphasis to it. Okay, so then skip down further now to the italicized portion of the homiletical outline. He says, a homiletical outline, in order for an effective sermon to take shape, Although the two may echo one another closely, an exegetical outline is not necessarily a homiletical outline. An exegetical outline establishes what a text says. A homiletical outline establishes how a text's meaning is best communicated to a congregation. So a homiletical outline is this. What's true? This is what's true. But uh, that's an exegetical. A homiletical outline now says, so what to that? what's true okay now go to page 115 i i said you could cross reference just to review this because he also mentions this over here and he says um Uh, exegetical outlines he says preachers have greater obligations than simply to report a text features to expound a passage, a preacher must explain context, establish meaning, demonstrate implications, and so forth. And he says, to accomplish these goals, an expositor designs a homiletical outline to develop a sermon faithful to the truths of a text and relevant, relevant to the needs. Now, let me say this as well. I've been asking you to, you know, prepare the sermon and word your proposition because such and such we must. And because I'm trying to get you to think in this homiletic way rather than just the exegetical. And that will help you do that when you say, this is what the text says, because this is what the text says. This is what we must do. And then I've been saying one of the best ways to have a homiletical outline is do what? Put what? Have a verb in your main points and not a to be verb, but a, a, a living a, a, action type of a verb because that will that will force you to be practical now that doesn't mean and i'm not saying that's the only way you can pre prepare a sermon i'm not saying that if you're if you're a pastor you probably you don't want to preach the same exact way every time you'll get tired of yourself and other people get tired of you too i'm sure people get tired of any pastor who they hear all the time i mean that's just come i mean that would be normal so i i think you know you need to have some variety in your preaching overall. But for this class, this is a good exercise for you to think this way to develop a homiletical outline. Did I lose you? Am I making, do I make sense? Am I, am I making sense? Do you, you follow me? Any questions about what I'm saying? So I don't want you just to tell me, and you're not, you've been doing a good job. The ones who've been doing it, you've been, you have to explain what's there. And then out of that, there has to be that application illustration and um, out of out of the explanation. Okay, so that I wanted to take just a couple minutes on, and then let me just finish this up tonight. 
there's interrogate and then organize. I'm just going to give you these blanks. Okay. Let me, let me just give you these blanks because I think I pretty much said what I wanted to say. So he talks about the exegetical versus homiletical. Look what he says on page 104 though. Can you go there just real quick? If, uh, Angela, do you have the book? Angela, could you please read on page 104 the paragraph that begins as a rule of thumb? Uh, it's the third paragraph down, as a rule of thumb. As a rule of thumb, expositors owe no more to explanation than what is necessary to make their points clear, but owe no less than what is necessary to prove their points. Keep reading. Yeah. Crystallize your thought as much as possible. Divide what is too lengthy. Group what is too numerous. Make the complex simple and not vice versa. Clarify the obscure. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Remember what I said earlier at the beginning of the class? I talked about Michael Jordan making the very difficult look simple. That's what he's saying there. Make the complex simple. So you want to crystallize your thoughts. I like that statement there. Crystallize your thoughts and use as few words as possible to say as much as you can. Okay, and then um, this is very good chapter. You want to read it. As I close tonight, go to the end of the chapter. I like, I love the illustration he uses to close this chapter. And it's on the bottom of page 111. And I'll read it. The last paragraph on page 111. He says, in one of the key debates during the formulation of the Westminster Confession of Faith, one scholar spoke with great skill and persuasiveness for a position that would have mired the church in political debates for many years. As the man spoke, George Gillespie prepared a rebuttal in the same room. As they watched him write furiously on a tablet, all the assembly knew the pressure on the young man to organize a response while the scholar delivered one telling argument after another. Yet when Gillespie rose, his words were filled with such power and scriptural persuasion that the haste of his preparation was not discernible. Gillespie's message so impressed those assembled as the wisdom of God that the opposing scholar conceded that a lifetime of study had just been undone by the younger man's presentation. When the matter was decided, the friends of Gillespie snatched from his desk the tablet on which he had so hastily collected his thoughts. They expected to find a brilliant summary of the word so masterfully just delivered by him. Instead, they found only one phrase written over and over and over again. Dalusem Domine. Give light, O Lord. Give light, O Lord. Over and over, Gillespie had prayed for more light from God. Instead of the genius of his own thought, this valiant reformer wanted more of the mind of God. His humble prayer for God was for God to shed more light on the word. And that is our goal. Light from God on the word. Okay. okay. Have a good evening, everyone. If you have a question. Last. The last blank there is biblical reason. I'm sorry. Yep. It is a serious mistake to appeal to a response to an argument when the listener does not understand the biblical reason for the truth. Biblical reason is the last blank on page 20 uh, in our notes under on page 26 under 3B. 3B. Thank you, Joe. All right. So next week, no quiz, just the three messages. You're good. We're, good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Hey, Pastor. Thank you. Good night, all. God bless. Okay, God, God bless you. Job, right? okay. God bless. Yeah, God bless you guys. Okay. Night, God bless. So any questions or I'll close the meeting. We're all good? All right. Bye-bye.